here in a second to give uh, Sheila the floor. And we would um, ask you to please pose your questions on the left-hand side of your screen in the little um, question and answers icon that looks like a speech bubble with a, a question mark in it. Thank you. Great, so, thanks again. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so I was a bit uh, delinquent in supplying a title because um, it is in a moment of great uncertainty that we take up the topic um, that has been the subject of this conference throughout. But I wanted to focus in on this idea of renewable because that is so much a buzzword in energy policy and energy talk, and yet what this future is that we're renewing and what renewing means anyway, um, I think remains a huge puzzle for us as we um, think together about, about the energy transition. So first of all, energy is, um, Leslie was kind enough to say that people have already been talking about socio-technical imaginaries. It's important to point out that cross-culturally and worldwide, energy, at least if you equate energy with fire, has been a topic of religious and philosophical um, deliberation uh, and the construction of imaginaries for as long as human civilizations have existed. So there on the left-hand side, you see the god Agni, who is one member of the Hindu pantheon from um, an old um, folk art uh, rendition. And on the right, you see William Blake's imagination of Prometheus, the Greek hero who brought fire, but to his own disadvantage, as it were, because then he was doomed to be chained and, and gnawed away at for daring to bring this um, energetic force into, into human habitation. So, the coupling of imaginaries with energy is not surprising to me. It's something that human societies have been grappling with for a very long time. And it's in that context that we, um, Sung Hyun Kim and I, uh, started thinking about energy imaginaries now more than a decade ago, really. Um, it's worth pointing out at the outset that, that our idea of imaginaries is not bound to the nation state context, even though because I do comparative work and really I'm interested in the ways in which nation states operate as one mode of opinion formation, one site of the formation of imaginaries, my work has tended to focus on the national. But the original definition we gave in, in the widely cited article containing the atom, um, embedded the nation state into the definition. And we said it was collectively imagined and communicated forms of social life that both embed and are embodied in. So those of you who are familiar with STS talk will see there the sort of co-productionist origins of the idea of sociotechnical imaginaries. And then we said in national scientific and or technological projects, because we were talking about nuclear power in the US and in South Korea, and in both places, of course, the nuclear has been very much an object of state attention and of national projects. But one can very easily talk about imaginaries occurring or being embedded in any kind of collective activity. And it was to take people away from the exclusive um, idea that only nation states have imaginaries, that we reworded the definition of imaginaries. So in my introductory chapter to Dreamscapes of Modernity, we have a more expansive definition, which I'm sure has been already talked about in the conference and various panel sessions, but we say collectively held and institutionally stabilized. So not specifically national scientific and or technological projects, but more broadly in any organizational form, and that they're animated by shared understandings of social life and social order. And of course, my idea of socio-technical imaginaries differs from all the other different articulations of imaginaries in that I don't think 
anyone else has made the effort to say that we live in technological civilizations and that imaginaries that do not theorize the place of science and technology in society are missing some important dimension of the ways in which we think about the past, the present, and the future. So that last bit that they're attainable through and supportive of advances in science and technology is, of course, an extremely important and significant part of the definition as STS scholars use sociotechnical imaginaries. Right, with that by way of background, it's important to point out that this idea of imaginaries, in a sense, it's an articulation of what one already sees happening, that ways that people are thinking. So this is, you know, part of interpretive social science is to put a name to phenomena that society is concocting. It's it is maybe analysts' language to use that anthropological term, but it's analysts' language for the ways in which society is already thinking. And in America in particular, in the United States, it's easy to point out that there has been for a very long time a conjunction between technological progress and civilizational progress. So this painting is often cited. It's often cited as an example of technological determinism. It is a late 19th century painting from 1872, John Gast's Spirit of the Frontier, but it could just as well be called American Progress because it's pointing to all the massive um, changes in the landscape and the way in which people carry out their lives that was taking place in that time and gave rise to a period of ferment that is not unlike the one that we're going through at the turn of the 21st century that we are now firmly lodged in. So there off on the right, you see the railroad replacing the stagecoach, which previously was the way that the pioneers went from one end of the continent to the other. And of course, this uh, interestingly female um, spirit, the spirit of the frontiers carrying the telegraph line. I have a particular sort of fondness for the telegraph line because I taught for so many years at Cornell University and the um, founding figure of that university, Ezra Cornell, made his money in effect in the telegraph line. So he was a potter and ceramicist and glass maker and he teamed up with Alexander Graham Bell because on top of the telegraph poles, there were these ceramic caps that held the wiring in place. So when I see this spirit of the frontier, I also think of the land grant colleges and the mission of higher education in that period of American history to become utilitarian. So these land grant universities were founded to help agriculture and to help military technologies and that spirit of academic work in the service of technological progress has been very much part of the ethos of the ways in which dreamscapes of modernity have developed and unfolded in America. So what can we set against it? Well, European thought and American thought have, I think, diverged in interesting ways and paralleled and complemented each other in interesting ways. In this year of 2021, thinking back approximately 100 years, it's um, when Max Weber wrote his famous um, essays on the profession of science and of politics, um, it's more broadly important to remember it's kind of a 100-year celebration of Weber, what he thought about when he visited America. And this is by now a kind of famous quotation for energy policy because he was talking about mass production and the Protestant ethic and the inevitability of certain kinds of progress. And so this order is now bound to the technical and economic conditions of machine production, he said. And then this rather pessimistic coda to this passage, perhaps it will so determine them until the last ton of fossilized coal is burned. So it's as if he's looking forward to certain features of what progress looks like and the 
connections between, as it happens, carbon emitting fuels and the kind of progress that we have bound ourselves to. So it's not just that progress is happening, but there is this technologically determinist undertone to the imagination of progress and people who crossed frontiers as Weber did when he came to America were struck by the dependence on this materialist set of transformations that was going on in the United States at the time. It's reflected again worldwide in a sense of control and in a sense that progress will actually liberate us. So this very well-known quotation of Louis Strauss, the first chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, that it's not too much to expect that our children will enjoy in their homes electrical energy too cheap to meet it. For those of you who are broadly speaking STS enthusiasts, this it's not too much to expect that has itself become a kind of trope. So when President Bill Clinton unveiled the first map of the human genome, he said something like, it's not too much to expect that our children or grandchildren will think of cancer only as a constellation of stars. I mean, so this idea that through the technology, we will make these, these great leaps forward and buy ourselves out of the human condition. No worries about Prometheus here. Nobody's liver is going to be gnawed away. Instead, it's going to democratize and it's going to be too cheap to meet her. So this was part of that same idea of deterministic progress that we get these advances in science and technology and they will set us free. And again, it's important to remember that this was not an imaginary that was closeted away only in the West. The newly emerging societies of the post-colonial world were very much thinking along the same lines. The arch bearer of this kind of ideology, Jawaharlal Nehru in India, the, the first prime minister of independent India, um, was completely committed to the idea of energy technologies, in his case, hydropower. So when he opened the famous Bakranangal project in India, uh, he said something that has echoed down through the decades as one of the sort of philosophical dimensions of the energy transition that was also the transition to independence. So energy independence and energy transition, these have gone hand in hand in our modern imaginaries in a worldwide sense. So he said, Bakra, the new temple of resurgent India is the symbol of India's progress. So this word progress being coupled to energy technologies. And that picture, the photograph of Nehru with Gandhi is an extremely famous one because in the contrast between the ways that the two men are dressed, you see a contrast that I will allude to a little bit later in the talk. I mean, so on the one hand, the large dam, which at that time was seen as the salvation and not in itself as an ecological problem that we need to worry about, contrasted against Gandhi's um, emphasis on the cottage industry, the homespun, the Kadi. This is the same way in which Gandhi is depicted at his spinning wheel. And the spinning wheel is a very, very different idea of technological embeddedness and progress from these large dams. I have a personal history with these dams because my father was the executive secretary of the Damodar Valley Corporation, which was the large development um, of um, River Valley um, uh, hydropower in eastern India and in Bengal and Bihar. And I actually grew up in my holidays being taken to these um, dams being built and people being moved. And in the background there, you see the Damodar Valley Corporation's headquarters in Calcutta and then some of the images. And um, again, this is part of autobiography, which was probably not known to most members of the audience, that as part of my father's work there with the DVC, he was sent to America to look at the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. And he was sufficiently imprinted by the idea of America himself that at some point a few years later, 
uh, he took a job with the United Nations and became one of the early people, early South Asians, um, to decide that the place to educate your children was in the United States and not in Britain. So we actually came to America in 1956 uh, as a result of indirectly this whole idea of energy and progress and the ways in which um, that um, vision has unfolded, that imaginary has unfolded in the South Asian and the Indian context. So imaginaries, of course, come from a whole variety of contexts. And I now want to move into um, the more sort of analytical and to some extent um, not entirely optimistic parts of what I want to say today. So there was the Cold War, and in some sense, we're possibly busy recreating the conditions for the 21st century version of that with a different bipolar form formation of China on the one side and the West or the United States on the other, with Europe poised in interesting ways in between. But one of the productions of the Cold War that has been extraordinarily important to the construction of socio-technical imaginaries is the Apollo program. And we've just gone through the 50th anniversary of it and in 2019. Um, and then this rather miraculous photograph that, of course, everybody is aware of now, the pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan called it, the perfect Earth image that shows the African continent and the Arabian Peninsula and the swirling clouds. And it became um, part of the impetus for our common future. The, it's clear that the description right in the beginning of that Brundtland Commission report is through and through imbued with people's sense of this vision. But it has led in the context of energy to other ways of thinking as well as, for instance, here. So we see the Earth now as a bounded space. That image has become itself a meme, and it's shown in various ways. And here it's grabbed in a wrench, showing that the idea of engineering, the fact that the Earth is now a space of engineering, is coupled the imagination of an engineerable planet. And it's coupled in this way to the idea of the overflowing bathtub, that it's a container that has reached its limits. The water is overflowing. And therefore, we can engineer the planet. Geoengineering, of course, is the most powerful um, kind of imaginary that has been associated with this idea of limits and transcending the limits, and therefore, what do we do about it? Well, we can start engineering the atmosphere to be more receptive or to be more resistant to um, the greenhouse gases and their warming effects. So that Apollo picture coming as it did out of bipolar conflict and out of a particular kind of political history has played its part in conditioning a global imagination of how we think about the planet, its resources, its limitations, and therefore, hand in hand, also what we're allowed to do about it and how we go about that business. And these ideas figure very prominently inside of the energy future imaginary. So one person who's been deeply imbued by this kind of thinking, and I think of him as almost as the apostle of the moonshot is Bill Gates, who through his foundation has been uh, urging that we develop big solutions to big problems. And he calls them the moonshot. The moonshot has become a normal English language word, uh, and it stands for the proposition that we can conceive of large problems and think of in uh, mythological terms, silver bullet solutions, the one shot that actually ends the entire problem. And Bill Gates has devoted his foundation to finding these kinds of moonshot cures for a variety of things. Energy is one of them, agriculture is one of them. Famously, of course, he's deeply interested in medicine and has targeted malaria as another of the things in his sights as part of the socio-technical imaginaries. Now, it's not 
it's easy to understand why the person who thought about colonizing software and is the Microsoft uh, visionary thinks of things as moonshots. I mean, the Microsoft Word is in everybody's computers and has affected the way all of us are living at the moment. Um, so you can see that he has some reason to have confidence in this idea. But the idea is not an innocent idea. And it goes hand in hand with a particular kind of idea of progress to which the name development has been given. It's that we stand, pretty much all of us, in, in fortunate parts of the world and we see others who are less fortunate. Um, they can be in our own societies, but um, particularly in Europe, you don't have the same kind of large underclass that we do in the United States. It's to some degree a somewhat less unequal society, but then we look at our other parts of the globe. And this is from, from an interview that Bill Gates did with Andrew Revkin in the days that Revkin, the environmental journalist, was still writing primarily for the New York Times. And he was asked about the moonshot, and he picked out India and energy as emblematic of the way he thinks. So, well, India is paradigmatic. Well, you know, it's only 1.4 billion people. I think he was exaggerating a little even then. So they have to electrify. So, you know, there you see the imaginary connected immediately to energy. That's where children don't die. They need to be able to refrigerate their food and heat and cook. And so if you think you have a solution that doesn't allow, sorry, doesn't slow down India, improving the lives, lives of their people to be almost as good as what we take for granted, you know, then you go ahead and do that, okay? So this is a, a kind of self-evident plea that we need the moonshot because it will improve the lives of 1.4 billion people because then the children will not die. But the, the sort of casual linearity of this passage by somebody whose intentions are as good as they could be. I mean, this is a benevolent industrial titan, no question about that. But to be almost as good as what we take for granted puts our present condition, whoever the we is in that passage, as the goal towards which other less fortunate societies are striving, and maybe they'll never quite get there. But then you think back to that image of American progress, and it becomes clear that in the mind of a West Coast benevolent, in a sense, dictator, because he can tell us how to live, there is this sense that America charts the future and other people gradually catch up to be almost as good as what we take for granted. So, of course, I'm saying something a little bit methodological as well, that once you have the idea of interpretive socio-technical imaginaries in your mind, you start seeing the performance and the re-performance of this in the ways in which people with the power to shape the world, whether through politics or in this case through capital, are actually thinking of how to deploy that capital and what kinds of futures we ought to be thinking about. So this is the production of a socio-technical imaginary happening in the context of an interview given by a person with a lot of power to shape our world. So go back to the Protestant ethic, and it's interesting that one of the things that Weber was deploring was materialism. And this little passage, which comes shortly after that fossilized fuels and the last ton being burned, strikes me as quite interesting in the context of a discussion about renewables. So Weber said material goods have gained an increasing and finally an inexorable power over the lives of men as at no previous period in history. Well, that inexorable, that sense of inevitability just imbues that part of his writing. But the material goods have gained an increasing power. That leads me to think about energy futures in a different way. I mean, so, of course, 
Weber was talking about profit and capital and materialism in that sense. But I have started wondering about renewables as a place where a kind of materialist imagination has taken over or has overwhelmed the social imagination in a sense. And I think that throughout the 20th century, one sees this evolution of a sort of fight about what's going to prevail. I mean, in what way does human creativity manifest itself and should it manifest itself? And here I want to say something about how I believe that we STS scholars, with our own turn towards materialism, are propagating in a way a strange articulation of this barbarian um, complaint or worry about material goods. I mean, to some extent, what are we doing with our scholarship about the human future and the whole rest of this talk? I want to juxtapose the material future with the human future in a sense. So long ago, when I first started thinking about imaginaries, I landed in Copenhagen for something. It seems very long ago that you landed anywhere for anything. But, but anyway, the welcome in the Copenhagen airport from ADB was this delightful picture of renewable energy and with all the windmills. And it said, connect emission-free power to the grid and then naturally. So it was the naturally that caught my attention enough that I snapped the picture because it was so much taking artifice and turning it into nature and the entire image you can think of as articulating an imaginary in which the the human made, the artificial, the artifactual, the material blends into and becomes coextensive with nature. So emission-free power to the grid naturally. And then you think about the ways in which other forms of technology have been naturalized as well. So if you go looking for pictures of the nuclear fuel cycle, you will find that it is articulated in terms that this could be an actor network diagram, but what's missing here is anything to do with the humans. And you know, those of you who've read Gabriel Hecht, for instance, in talking about uranium mining, or indeed going back to Langdon Winner, I mean, so in STS work, including of course mine, there is a sense that these kinds of diagrams in elevating the material and talking about something like the fuel cycle or the nuclear cycle, or the hydrological cycle for that matter, as simply a matter of materials passing through space and taking on different forms and moving from mines into waste, that there is a kind of erasure going on that we should at least be concerned about and worry about as we think about futures. Um, fairly recently, I was in Chicago where the first um, contained nuclear um, explosion was carried out. And there is this um, marker, which I thought was interesting. I mean, caution, do not dig. So I'm sure many of you are aware that there's been a discussion not only around Yucca Mountain, but more broadly, of course, in Finland and in other places about, about what we should do as human beings with with the nuclear waste. I mean, so part of that fuel cycle imaginary is that we put the waste into the ground. And, you know, obviously people have been chipping away at this um, little marker. And it's interesting that there is no danger to visitors at the end. Somebody obviously felt strongly enough about this that they started chipping away at the no, but there is still this ghostly no visible underneath the chipping away. But we've created this clean energy and then we put these markers around it. So we don't need to think ahead to how Yucca Mountain will be marked up. We already have in our own accessible history some ideas about what's going to happen and what could happen um, inside of human lifetimes. There are other places you can go to where the human is more elevated and brought, brought to the forefront. But it's interesting to think about the media through which we do this. So this is a painting, a very famous painting by Ben Shan, which is in the Fukushima Museum, or at least one copy of it is. And this refers to the Lucky Dragon episode in which 
this Japanese fishing boat was exposed to um, uh, one of the um, above ground tests that the US was carrying out and the person who died is holding in the image this um, um, poignant statement, I'm a fisherman, we did not know what happened to us on September 23rd of that year, I died of atomic burn. So these, it doesn't have to be represented as the nuclear fuel cycle, it could be represented in other ways. And these are some pictures that I myself took when I went to Fukushima in 2018 and was struck at the way the landscape has been transformed. It's interesting that people talk about the earthquakes and the and the vulnerability of the nuclear power plant, plant site, but I've not been able to find an article that really talks in detail. I mean, even a sort of basic STS article that actually tracks the earth, we know that there are plans to do things with it. But at the time I visited, there were something on the order of 10,000 different sites looking like this. So behind that lattice, which is supposed to keep you out, there were these covered mounds, which are essentially bags and bags and bags of radioactive soil removed from the Fukushima site. And partly I took this picture because of the standing ponds as well. It was a kind of rainy, slushy day, as you see, it had actually snowed. But everything that you would think you should not have at a nuclear site, right? I mean, that is water that, and you know, how well sealed are these bags? And, you know, should one have a little chipped away sign, there is no danger to visitors. I mean, I guess, I was there and not wearing a little Geiger counter or whatever, but but in any case, it just seemed to me, a, a, you know, a part of the ramifications of this containment imagination that um, is worth recording and is worth our continuing to think about. And then what else? Well, one of the things that you see in Fukushima City is a by now abandoned refugee um, uh, residential site. So this is right near the Fukushima town hall. So across from the city hall, in that public space, there were bags and bags of radioactive soils. And then on the other side of the street, these little housing shelters that had been um, thrown up because um, the uh, people from the most contaminated places had to be housed somewhere. And they're every bit as much environmental refugees and something has been written about them. but. I could not Google and find an image in which the nuclear fuel cycle is actually represented together with and along with these kinds of consequences as part of the same image. And I should produce that, but I haven't had time yet. So maybe somebody in the audience actually will or has already done so. So we as STS scholars writ large and by STS scholar, I personally mean not only people who are anointed with the label STS, but people who have influentially thought about science, technology, and society. We hold somewhat different views about our responsibility and our position in offering visions of technological futures and in situating ourselves vis-a-vis -vis technology. And so Bruno Latour and Ulrich Beck have always struck me as interesting um, uh, not exactly polls, but as two people who have articulated somewhat different visions with respect to things that we might think of when we think about energy futures. Um, so Latour wrote a famous essay, Love Your Monsters, in which he proposed that the problem was not that we have made things that are extremely um, powerful. So we can... I mean, it's almost as it's almost as celebratory as American progress and that vision of John Gast. We can fold ourselves into the molecular machinery of soil bacteria through our sciences and technologies. We run robots on Mars. This is a particularly good week for thinking about that. We photograph and dream of further galaxies. And yet we fear that climate could destroy us. So, you know, we shouldn't be fearing, we should be taking, we should be loving our monsters. I mean, so that is the message of that essay. Whereas in Beck's 
famous essay, Anthropological Shock. What he is interested in is what has happened to us as citizens. We have lost sovereignty. And it's a particular kind of sovereignty that Beck has in mind in that particular essay and in his thinking about nuclear power more broadly. I mean, that is the very the very things that Latour calls attention to, the molecular machinery. I mean, these things are things that science and technology have brought into being, but they're not accessible to us. They're not tangible to us. They're not part of the ways in which we live. So where we put ourselves in reimagining futures, especially in a moment when lots of people are talking about what the future after COVID will be, are we on the Latourian side, celebratory, becoming primarily stewards of our magnificent technologies with which we accomplish things? Or are we equally and also thinking about the lost capacities, the losing of the sovereignty? I think that where we situate ourselves as scholars in relation to these imaginaries, I mean, so these people are also propagating imaginaries, and I'm not averse to propagating them myself, but I want to do neither the Latourian nor the Beckian. So where else can one go for inspiration? Well, people have been thinking about energy in connection with forms of life, as I've said, all the time. And we can think about people who are the opposite of Bill Gates and who would one put up against him. So here are two people from the mid to, you know, last quartile of the 20th century who are apostles of smallness in a sense. So one is E.F. Schumacher, who was canonical because he actually wrote this book, Small is Beautiful, and the other is Jane Jacobs, who thought about a certain kind of urbanism, and both of them thought about smallness in a sense. So Jane Jacobs is well known as somebody who, in the context of cities, thought that urban renewal had been a blight on the American landscape because it had got rid of forms of integrated human lives that uh, were um, um, the place where urban life renewed itself in some sense. So urban renewal for her ruled out a different kind of renewal. And you will see I'm cycling back to the title of this talk, playing on the question of renewal, what is being renewed. And Schumacher in Small is Beautiful famously sets an upper limit on the size of the ideal city. So probably the order of magnitude of 500,000 inhabitants, he said, could be looked upon as the upper limit for the ideal city. Um, he was loath to talk about a lower limit, but he thought that the kind of social connectivity that you need for renewal was lost if you thought bigger than that. So these thoughts were to some extent, I mean, they are in my mind because of what I write and what I teach, but I want to conclude by talking about a, the last field site visit I made, which was in January of 2020 to a place called Pavagada in um, um, uh, near Bangalore um, in uh, southern India. And it's being billed as the second largest solar park development. And of course, solar parks are very much about renewables. I mean, the sunlight is renewable. And I hadn't really thought about the ambiguity of this term renewable until we were taken by my colleague, Leo Saldana of the Environment research group to the solar park. And you go there and you see, in effect, an ocean, because this is a very, very large development indeed. And this, as far as the eye could see, which is a normal trope in English literary language, um, it's literally as far as I could see, E-Y-E -E now, as well as the first person pronoun. And it's like, a sea of glass having been overlaid on the territory. And it made me aware of the materiality, the materialism of the capture of the renewal. So many things about these things are not renewable. The, um, if one were to trace the life cycle of these 
um, each and every one of these rectangles of glass, one would find that there's a material dimension to the production and an as yet uncounted material dimension to the waste footprint that will be left, not to mention the material of keeping it functioning. So the fact that you need water constantly to wash off these um, 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 solar fuel panels, I mean, solar energy panels, uh, is to some extent erased in this picture, although it was present in the actual site visit because you saw the the equipment with which um, these um, panels are being kept clean. And of course, there's a lot of ingenuity going into now creating more efficient ways of managing all of this. But nevertheless, it's very much part of the, the proposition that in order to make the renewable renewable in terms of a form of life, namely energy, you have to do a lot of things that are not renewable, like fixate materially the capacity to bring the sun down to earth in the way that is described here. My colleague who's depicted there on the right was talking to the man who was guarding this site. There was one man in charge of that whole place and he's now wearing a uniform and looking pretty much like he could have stepped out of you know, any kind of industrial site anywhere in the world. And he said that up until a couple of years ago, he had been a farmer and how much happier he was being guardian of this site because now he was getting steady rental income. Whereas I think you can see just from the backdrop that it's a very arid landscape otherwise. So this was a particularly happy camper. He and his brothers had pooled together and had um, uh, leased their entire site for 25 years. And of course, he wasn't thinking what was going to happen beyond the 25 years. But then we went to a nearby village and it was mid-afternoon and all the men in the village were um, sitting around this um, gathering place and uh, they sort of swarmed my colleague and said that he really shouldn't come there because he had destroyed their lives, that now there was nothing for them to do. They could go to Bangalore for, to find work, but that was a couple of hundred kilometers away. and. Um, there were no jobs left in the neighborhood because the farming had been difficult, but with its disappearance, there was no other economy there. And after my colleague explained to them that we were not the people who had designed the park or had brought it into being, then they became extremely friendly and they insisted that we should not go away without having tea. And that is a picture of the villagers looking happy for the first time you know during our visit and they insisted on keeping us with them and engaging with them in the forms of sociality and sociability that mattered most but the fact is that those solar fuel panels have displaced the political economy of the area and with it a form of life that after all had been renewable for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So the renewability of bringing the sun down to earth had obviously affected other forms of renewability and who knows what will happen to the younger people in that picture as they go through their lifetimes. So one can bring this back home and end with a couple of propositions that are just standard fare in STS, but where do we go with them when we talk about the energy transition and energy futures? We all know, I think, that conventional wisdom should be questioned in these particulars. So for instance, the idea that technology is neutral and there in the left hand and the right hand columns, I've put down the kind of what we believe as STS scholars as opposed to what is the case uh, still as conventional wisdom in the policy world. Um, but my meta question now is why the persistence of that left-hand column way of thinking? I mean, the fact is that people with a great deal more power to shape and change the world, people of the power of a Bill Gates, very much still believe that technological progress is the way to go, that you innovate, that you disrupt, that you let things go and you will get to 
better results. Myself, I would advocate for a return to other domains of activity and not to technological innovation as sources of normative insight. And there, I think that nature, science, and the common law, my other professional field, and indeed human history point to a different set of ways about thinking about technology and how we valorize forms of technology. And what I've suggested throughout the talk is that there have always been people who have worried about the revolutionary, the disruptive, the large scale, the massive, the sudden leap forward or great leaps forward for that matter, and instead have advocated for more incremental, provisional, skeptical, experimental, and inclusive forms of life through which we can learn not from disaster, but from the daily experiences of building that which is to make what is to become. And that is the idea of an imaginary that I want to leave with you. And thank you for your attention. And let us now open the way to discussion. Thank you very much, Sheila, for your interesting talk. Um, yeah, you are basically making the case for small scale, human centered change, I guess, or energy transitions. And um, this made me just think of how the German Energiewende actually started a process of many small scale energy cooperatives across the country across the country and energy communities as well, that interestingly, of course, um, thrived, especially in those areas that had protested against nuclear power in the 1980s. So that's one of the associations that come from your talk <laughs> immediately. And also um, from the set that I just uh, visited before entering your talk, we were talk talking about why actually for example, electric mobility, which is actually the field of expertise of my colleague Viet, why electric mobility has not had this paradigmatic effect um, on our societies, even though it has been propagated for decades and has now been taken up even by governmental institutions for at least 10 or if not more years. So that said, I would like to open the floor to some questions. Do we have any questions yet? Yeah, please. I don't see any yet. Yeah, please use the opportunity to type in on this on the left side of the screen. You have this little bubble with a question mark in it, and you open it. Then you can type in your question. Please do that, and Leslie and I we will take these questions and uh, ask Sheila. And before you. Type in. I have a question, Sheila. Um, what do you see any any potential image of a how to say of a post fossil world in in your sense? Not not this picture of mills of windmills which you saw when you when you arrived in Copenhagen. Do you have a an, an candidate of a an convincing picture which is um, which is the expression of what we? can call in post-fossil energy world? A post-fossil energy world that is not necessarily tied to these grandiose ambitions. I mean, so I think that the theoretical point that I'm making is the co-productionist point that when we, that in our own thinking, and I'm using the we rather loosely, but certainly a sort of generic Western policy world thinking about post-fossil, not enough attention is paid to whether it's also post-material, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and that particularly with these solar energy things, there's been an enormous amount of um, silencing of the material implications of going about pinning the sun's rays to the earth in a sense. I mean, so this is, but every time we've tried to take a source of energy that's out there in nature and tried to put it to human uses, 
we have engaged in a set of material transformations that either are not looked at uh, or are underplayed in terms of their impact. So take the kind of Nehruvian vision of the temples of modern India. I mean, of course, temples are also material interventions and they also have costs and we could have a whole side note about them. But the fact is that the World Commission on Dams propounded sort of at the end of the at the turn of the century that we should not be building high dams after many, many, many of these had already been built with huge detrimental effects on ecological systems. But why is that? I mean, it was that the dams were in a sense being naturalized as, you know, they that they were not having a particular impact. I mean, they were just a pass-through point. And similarly with um you know, with the nuclear nuclear imaginary, um, you know, one of the things that I, as a lawyer, started noticing about the American context was the ease with which the back end of the fuel cycle was simply erased as not something we care about. And this was done, you know, in a sort of interesting way by referring to judicial doctrine of administrative deference. So the EPA had decided that all it was interested in was the, the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle and having radiation standards, but it had decided to, quote, set the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle to zero in terms of risk. And then that decision was upheld in the Supreme Court, not on the basis of scientific evidence, but on the basis of administrative discretion, because in our doctrinal system, it's the, it's the executive agency does, that does this. So to wind back to your question, it's not, I mean, post-fossil fu fuel futures itself, of course, an imaginary, as I needn't tell you, it's the, what is involved in the, I mean, post what in particular, right? I mean, so, is it post, I mean, this is why I said, is it post material? I mean, if you go to the so called disadvantaged and backward forms of life, which are socially deeply problematic for many reasons, not to, not least because they're heavily gendered often, um, you do find that they may not be post fossil, but they're not, their imprint on the world in terms of carbon emissions, of course, have been lower. And this is a debate that has gone on in sustainability studies forever and ever. Which should you target? Should you be targeting consumption or should you be targeting the emissions at the end of the, of the consumption system? So, you know, it's not, of course, ever an either or. And in all of our forward-looking American cities now, we see that the entire urban infrastructure is being remade to accommodate bicycles, you know, which we are not a culture that has ever been like the Netherlands or like Denmark. But, you know, you do see, I mean, what is being tackled there is, in fact, consumption and the ways in which people live with it. Um, I guess what I want, now this is because I'm not the technologist, I'm not the engineer. What I want is to think about the forms of deliberation that go along with these decisions. And these, in that Pavagada Solar Park, I can tell you that the forms of deliberation were none. I mean, basically, these were large energy companies, some of them international, talking to the Indian government in Delhi. And it's quite clear that there was not a set of deliberative structures in which I mean, again, to turn your question around, it's not, are there images of post-fossil futures? I do think that there are low fossil pasts, which we are in effect replacing with high energy futures and then thinking, well, how can we make the high energy into low fossil fuel? Um, but that is a set of transitions that it's every bit as much social as technological. And the question of, what forms of inclusion or deliberation are going on, that is, for me, a sort of thing to foreground when there's so much inequality, even in the imaginations. I mean, the people who are creating those solar panels are in a, in a different world, literally, from the people who gave us tea and coffee at the end of the day. Sheila, we are receiving a few questions now. 
from our audience. And one actually um, speaks exactly to what you were saying just now. It's about energy infrastructures and how they um, crystallize certain socio-technical imaginaries and potentially also actualize them. And this person asks, how much room do you think there is for alternative ideas and visions for the future to be accommodated by energy infrastructures that originated in response to certain particular um, and powerful imaginaries? So, and how can they be designed so that they can be more inclusive to accommodate different visions of the future? And this is an excellent question, and it's something that together with my colleagues, um, in particular Zilke Beck in Leipzig and with Andy Sterling at SPRU, we've been researching as part of the Belmont project. And you know, the so what comes first? Is it the is it the alternative or is it um, the ideology almost that one should be looking for alternatives at all? Um, in my own scholarship, what I've tried to do is to show that we don't need to imagine out of nothing alternatives. I mean, so Leslie's first comment was that in Germany, partly as an embedded consequence of the mobilization against nuclear, there were already experimental sites available in which people thought about the grid and the connection to the grid and the level at which one could achieve zero carbon um, outputs um, in a different way. I mean, so, you know, from the standpoint of the US, you don't have to go into a village in the Amazon. Germany is sufficiently other. You know, every time I come to Germany, I'm struck at how two highly modern, highly committed to industrialization societies still foreground, you know, quite different views and values. And this is not I'm not making a value judgment that one is better or the other is better, but if one wants to think about technological futures, I and mean, the fact is I've lived in Berlin for many months at a stretch, I never felt the need for a car. And I could go from end to end of this massive city and the connections, I mean, okay. I mean, many of the stations have staircases that are not so great if you're carrying a little suitcase. And, you know, it's not that there are not inconveniences. But the fact is that in America, I could not imagine going a week in Cambridge, Massachusetts without a car. I mean, I have to go shopping. And yes, there were times when I was living in Grunewald and I felt annoyed that I had to you know, go somewhere and lug these bags of groceries home. But nevertheless, it was possible. Here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, seen as the forefront of intellectual development, we do not think about improving public transportation. We think of making bike lanes. So that is an individual solution. So you go from cars, which are individual, to bikes, which are individual, and you do not think about public transportation. Now, this is clearly racialized and ethnicized because, you know, if you just sit around, I mean, I haven't done the ethnographic field work, but I can tell you that the population uh, on bikes is not representative of the population in the Boston urban area. Whereas if you look at public transportation, you see a different thing. Now I've gone to Paris and you would think that the underground city is a different color combination from the overground city. So it's not just Boston, but you know, these are ways in which the infrastructures, I mean, why is it that the car infrastructure is giving way to the bike infrastructure and not to the bus infrastructure. I mean, you know, these are questions that we, I think, need to be asking. And the alternatives exist. I mean, they exist even in other functioning societies. So that is, you know, another thing to remind ourselves. Okay. Uh, when you come to Germany next time, stay in Oderbruch for, for a time, then you, you will... <laughs> <laughs> we see we have the same structure that the US. Some, uh, As I say, I'm not an unquestioning admirer of any of the numerous <laughs> societies that I know and love at some level, but, but not totally. There's, a, there's another question from the audience. Um, can you explain a bit more about how your perspective of co-production can be used as a lens for better understanding the materiality of renewables that are being produced in energy transitions? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I see, 
socio-technical imaginaries as a working out of co-production. I mean, and I mean, co-production is a stance and it's an interpretive lens. Once you see that this is a way in which the world behaves, and I'm not trying to be colonialist in my imagination, you can describe the way the world moves in many, many different ways. But if you see that an important feature of the world is that when we create new representations of the way the world works, we are also making normative invitations, making normative inroads that we should be living in accordance with that. Um, once you see that, then you have to ask next step questions. So anybody can see that in the latter half of the 20th century, we globalized the environment to some extent through a set of technologies like the Apollo mission, that we started seeing environmental phenomena as not just local pollution, not just point sources, but as something global. And hand in hand with that came an idea of global governance that you know, our common future is a text, a, an ur text, if you will, having to do with that phenomenon. It, you could see that as a site of co-production because in effect, it's saying we have learned to see the world this way and we should respond to the world in this way. It's in the text, it's inseparable. But you can also see that book as the bearer of a sociotechnical imaginary or a set of sociotechnical imaginaries. It then goes through, you know, medium by medium and talks about you know, different things that we should be doing and shouldn't be doing for sustainability. Sustainability itself is a sociotechnical imaginary. So for me, the sociotechnical imaginary is a way of asking certain kinds of questions that are not instantly accessible from co-production itself. So in particular, coming to the material, why are some visions sticky and not others? So I think that the American highway system enables mobility, but it enables mobility in certain ways that are consistent with the individualist ethos of this country. And so to me, the fact that we take roads and convert them into another individualist transportation form is an illustration of that co-produced imaginary, that the thing that doesn't move is that solutions lie at the level of the individual it's individual choice. And it's very difficult to shift from that to no, it's a collective responsibility and therefore we should think about collectives as well. And as you know, no doubt, in the last election, one of the reasons given for why the quote down ballot unquote, not the presidential level, but below that, Democrats did not do as well as they had hoped was a successful targeting of the democratic paradigm as socialist by the critics from the right. I mean, so that is, you know, it was a moment of performance in which a socio-technical imaginary or a set of socio-technical imaginaries were definitely at stake because, you know, what is the Green New Deal going to be about? It is a socio-technical imaginary, right? But it was bumping up against a fairly sticky American proposition that that politics should be at the level of individual preference and individual initiative and not collectivized. They will come away and they will come and take away your hamburgers. I mean, you know, that has proved to be in the McDonald's culture, you know, a sort of quite severe threat. So that's the way in which I would loop together co-production, imaginaries and materi materiality, you know, into a sort of theoretical statement. Dila, we have more, another question, very interesting one by Sara Larijani, whose talk I was lucky enough to see earlier this week. Uh, I believe she's using your um, concept of socio-technical imaginaries in her PhD project. And she says, first of all, thank you so much for your interesting talk. And then uh, she has a keen eye. She says, in the painting on um, the American frontier, you did not mention the war scene on the left side of the landscape. <laughs> and now she asks, how do you or socio-technical imaginaries research explain the relation of that goddess of the telegraph with the wars of frontier making in the US? And do imaginaries of modernity, civility and progress in some parts of the world relate to the plunder and appropriation of life 
elsewhere on the planetary scale? And if so, how does um, co how is this co-production reflected in the theoretical foundation of socio-technical imaginaries? Um, well, again, thanks for the question. And yes, yes, yes to many of the propositions that are embedded in the question. Um, so, you know, the word violence is very popular in critical discourse and the fact that um, in particular, colonial hegemony went with violence, um, hand in hand with violence. I mean, you you can read a thousand works on that proposition and your frontier point, you know, you can read it as progress if you think that those were forms of life that deserved to be rooted out. And certainly Americans in the, the 18th and 19th centuries thought that, and, you know, today... We're having a resurrection, recognizing that plunder and appropriation were very much part of it. I mean, so this has now slipped out of the bounds of post-colonial discourse, where it has been present for a very long time, and is even in the fact that in the U.S. and Cambridge Mass now, many people are doing an acknowledgement of territory before they start their talks, referring specifically to a kind of apologia for the violence that you saw in that picture. So I think it's in our um, cultural ambiance at the moment uh, to be acknowledging responsibility for having spread not just the mission civilisatrice, but at the expense of a very uh, violent attitude and approach to other societies and cultures. Now, what interests me, I mean, I take all of this as kind of given. I mean, that is by now it's given. It's that, you know, modern industrial civilization made its way through a lot of violence. I mean, you can read Weber and you can read Charles Dickens to see that this violence was not just outside of one's own societies, it was inside of one's own societies as well. Mass production came at a cost. One of the costs that matter to me is not just the physical violence, but also the constraint on the mental imagination. I mean, the forms of life that we can adopt and not adopt. And so the standardization uh, of ways of thought is something that I care about and take as part of my domain of research. You can call it violence. I do consider it, in a sense, violence, because you're eradicating the possibilities of the human spirit, which is something that I'm interested in. I mean, I come from a culture in which notions of the human spirit are understood in a very different way from the way they are in Christianity. And even though I was brought up entirely secular and remain entirely secular, I know that these traditions think about things in different ways. So even tacitly, when I put Agni next to Prometheus, I am trying to strike a blow for alternatives and to say, look, these imaginations are grounded in different ways in different places. So one of the kinds of standardization that that I work with is reason. I mean, so we are in societies where we think that actions should be reasonable. And what I want to do in my critical work is to point out to people that making reason, making those things that are rational and reasonable, involve a stamping out of alternatives. Now, I live and work in one of the world's foremost reason-making institutions. And I deal with 17-year-olds, and I deal with 65-year-olds who've returned for a dose of further education. So I'm looking at a wide spectrum of the American and the international population. And I see the ways in which the way we pick and choose people already has narrowed the funnel. That is, you know, who is a Harvard undergraduate, given that we know that for every one that is accepted, there are 10 or 11 others that could have been accepted and were not. So who are we picking and who are we elevating into this global elite? What are we teaching as public policy? I mean, you know, STS teaching is not commonplace in policy schools. And in my life of the last 23 or four years, 
I've been asked many times, how did you make your way into the Kennedy School? Anyway, I won't answer that question now, but let me tell you, it's not orthodox thinking when you're telling people to go out and figure out how to bring post-fossil fuel futures into being that they start questioning, well, what forms of life are you stamping out thereby? So you will see that in my own way, I was with my Pavogada story talking about a kind of violence in effect. I mean, that a form of life had been, you know, really utterly erased by another form of life. So is it the society whose renewability we should be concerned about? Not that I think the society will be the same 100 years from now. But if you start from the end point of which thing are you considering renewable and whose renewability are you most concerned about, those solar panels are not interested in what happens to the young lad who is now 13 or 14 years old, who might have led a hard scrabble life as a dry area, arid land farmer, and that may not be an ideal thing. But to put solar panels in there, knowing that 25 years from now, that will be wasteland because you'll have to get rid of those panels somehow. And we don't yet have the technologies of rehabilitation and recomposition, that that land has essentially been desertified. But are we saying solar panels desertify land? No, these are seen as coming from different semantic boxes. So, you know, I think that the violence is going on. The violence is going on through the same phenomena that Max Weber saw a hundred years ago, and he's very out of fashion as a social scientific thinker because he didn't quantify his own ways of thought and didn't establish Erklären as much as he established Verstehen, and Verstehen is not popular. Um, Erklärung is. Uh, but you know, we we discuss in in, in some circles about agro PV. So this is maybe an, an answer to your uh, question: how to um, how to manage this problem after 25 years um, photovoltaic parks. Um, but that leads me to the question from the audience: uh, question by Tim Moss. He asks, can you say things, something about the governance implications of your way of making transitions incremental, provisional, skeptical, experimental, inclusive, and what you said, learning? Uh, what, what what impact for governance has your, your approach? Well, thanks again. Um, obviously, one has to have a critique of capital and the forms of tacit governance of neoliberalism and privatization that we see in, in, es in essence, in archetypal form in the US. And so the most concrete way in which I am engaged in thinking about all of this is through a project of mine that's not about energy, but is about biotechnology. It's the Global Observatory for Gene Editing. Um, so I see genome editing as one of these technological frontiers where actually, Leslie, my most recent book is Can Science Make Sense of Life? And it's a sort of reflection on the ways in which science and technology have made themselves into tacit constitutional partners of elected governments and elected states. And that going together with the post-1989 privatization and you know, the sort of global judgment that socialism had failed and therefore um, private enterprise should thrive. I mean, again, I'm not saying anything new here that people have recognized that at least two different resources, the genetic resource and the data resource, have in effect been privatized without much control at all. I mean, so the people who command the technology also own that resource. Data, you know, belatedly through GDPR, I mean, you know, there are the beginnings of a regulatory environment beginning to spring up. But just as the rubber barons with the railroads and the oil pipelines reaped unjust rewards at a certain time, we're seeing the same kind of thing happening. So my global observatory, which I'm engaging in with colleagues, because this is not the sort of thing one does alone, is an attempt to bring together alternative understandings of what it means to be a participating citizen and a deliberative citizen in a global polity that is forming whether we like it or not. Um, and I don't 
No. I mean, if I knew the answer, I would not be true to my own ethos. I mean, these steps, I, I can see where people go wrong. I mean, so for instance, if people adopt in the genome context a universalizing idea of bioethics, I think that that is wrong because there is no universal standard of bioethics. I mean, I often point out to my colleagues, and they hear, but they do not take in my American law colleagues, look, in America, we are still debating, is the fetus entitled to human dignity and life from the moment that it is conceived? And we do our right-left politics along that line of division. Well, look at Germany. You know, the fetus is considered to have life from the moment of cellular nuclear fusion. But nevertheless, the abortion laws are not a place where party politics has fallen out. Yes, at the time of reunification, it was a big deal that some compromise was worked out and a different set of norms came into being. So it's astonishing the degree of ignorance people have about other ways of taking the triad of politics, ethics, and materiality and rethinking them in other ways. So my very modest and, you know, how much can one person do answer is institutional change to bring about deliberative spaces that are not Habermas's ideal speech communities, and they're not Rawls's ideas of getting all the citizens to shed their, you know, things that should be behind the veil of ignorance and, and come together, but actual functioning societies that have thought about things in more complicated ways, putting their complexities together in a certain way. So if you call it sort of ethnographic political theory, that's the sort of place where I myself am searching for next steps forward. I won't call them answers. I mean, you know, it would be, I mean, one thing I've learned is not to be hubristic about my own capacities. Okay, thanks, Sheila. I think we have uh, space for one, one more question, although there's a few more in line, but I will pick one. It's by Ross Wallace. And um, I think it, it sort of works well with your answer just now. He asks, how could you please comment on how imaginaries can be co-opted by dominant ideologies? For example, we are increasingly seeing the language of energy democracy or citizenship used in the service of market liberalization and individual prosumption. Well, it's one of those questions that I think is more an invitation to keep on reflecting. We know very well how any ideology can co-opt anything. I mean, you know, the... Um, I often think of a scene out of Tennyson's um, poem about the death of Arthur in which um, he tells um, his um, faithful knight that um, it is time for him to be leaving the scene because um, I have lived my life and that which I have done may he within himself make pure. And then he goes on to say less that he has to go lest one good order should corrupt the world. Um, you know, he, so he invented the round table, which one can take as an emblem of, of Habermasian deliberation many hundreds of years before Jürgen came into the world. Um, but, you know, if, if Tennyson thought about Arthur as having perfected a form of deliberative democracy, but then relinquishing it, lest one good order should corrupt the world. Um, I think we see something in there worth reflecting upon um, because I, th I think anything is in that sense corruptible, but what's corruptible, what does corruption even mean? I mean, you know, first of all, what is our own ethical sense of the good out of which we see the turning toward the bad and the evil that causes us to say corrupt? I mean, we say inclusivity, but what do we actually mean by inclusivity and where in the world do we tinker? I mean, to some extent, we don't think that even if you have wrongheaded ideas that, you know, putting you into an isolation booth and keeping you in solitary confinement till you start thinking a different way is the right answer. So there are, 
places that we don't want to go because there are values in conflict. Now, there's no question that people with resources, the resources that are valorized by the world, have power in that sense. And, you know, I, I think that for myself, I decided around the time that I came to Harvard that if I was interested in making institutional change to articulate some of the kinds of value things you're raising, I mean, the co-optation and the corruption and how can you prevent that, I would have to think about the institutional parameters within which I could reasonably hope to make any kind of change. And even that is is not very easy because if you're wanting to, I mean, education is an extremely powerful way of affecting the way that people think. and if we're always teaching that certain forms of life are to the good. I mean, yesterday I was in a discussion where people were talking about the concept of effective altruism. But effective altruism, the way that it's been used, means that somebody has already got a lot of resources to solve problems and then is being urged to be altruistic with it. And there were students in the class who asked, you know, why is the stress always on the big problem and not on little problems? So why isn't it on individual interactions? And, you know, I had a way, because I'm one of the co-instructors of the course, to say that, you know, you're putting your finger on a real thing. I mean, how do you get at the big? Is it through the, the combination of many littles or is it the moonshot where you come in with the equipment to do the big? Um, and one reason I like that, I mean, so if you go back over my slideshow, you will see in a way that I was addressing this set of questions on almost every slide. I mean, so the juxtaposition between Nehru and Gandhi, neither of whose systems, I mean, if I had to say which am I sympathetic to, it's of course, I was brought up in the Nehruvian system and that is the ideology. Secularism is an ideology, but I do embrace it. So in that sense, I would sooner probably live in the Nehruvian world myself, but, but not unaware of its consequences. But Gandhi built a movement that is the alternative, right? I mean, that is, it was a mobilization and it was a mass mobilization and it was explicitly out of a no resources position, building up resources. And, and one of the things I teach is that nonviolence is one of the great socio-technical imaginaries of the 20th century, but we don't put it on a par with the atom and the gene. And, you know, maybe we should. And then then that way one can begin to reconstruct the, the alternative imaginaries coming from somewhere else in society. And, you know, going back to co-production, it is a symmetry point that if you're going to think about making change, do not always start at the frontiers of technological progress. Go somewhere else, almost anywhere else, and you'll get a different starting point and a different pathway. That's a nice word at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Sheila. It's been uh, a great pleasure to have you. Um, everybody enjoyed uh, your talk very much. Many thanks from the audience, many thanks from us. Thank you for and the invitation. We, we hope to see you at the WZB in person <laughs> I will sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And greetings. Thank you. Bye-bye.